Coming up, we talk to one of Madonna's original backup dancers. He did his thing in the Blonde Ambition Tour. He starred in Truth or Dare. Then he sued Madonna along with his colleagues. Find out about his remarkable life working with the likes of Michael Jackson, Cher, Gaga and more. That's right, Kevin Stay is in the fortress. Coming to you from the mountain fortress of pop culture. You're listening to Time to Talk. You don't think I'm overexposed, do you? Well, he's worked with Michael Jackson, Lady Gaga, Rihanna and Taylor Swift, but Kevin Stay is possibly best loved for the role he played in Madonna's iconic Blonde Ambition Tour and, of course, the accompanying rockumentary Truth or Dare, which caused early onset puberty for thousands of teenagers around the world. Make no mistake about it. Kevin, welcome to Time to Talk. (laughs) What an intro, I love it. (laughs) (laughs) It's true though, isn't it? This was a sexually charged era. Yes, it was a different different time, different time. I mean, I didn't even know myself I was gay at the moment. Well, I can tell you what, Kevin, if it gave erections to young men watching it on a screen, I can only imagine that it must have burst the zipper off those within that hot and sweaty inner sanctum. (laughs) <laughs> it was it was definitely sexually charged, but we were um, we were focused on work. <laughs> oh, now come on! I hope that's not the way this conversation's going. Focused <laughs> on work. Give me a break. <laughs> you and or I rather, have a long way to go before we know each other very well. <laughs> we're focused on working it. <laughs> <laughs> that's better. I like that. So, look, it's it's been a very long time since Blonde Ambition. Are the memories fading? Uh, somewhat, but it was such a very specific and seminal moment in my life, uh, that taught me so much. I, I kind of have held on to every memory quite tightly. Um, I'm sure some details have shifted here and there. I, I really find that out when, or found that out when the other dancers and I got together, we kind of remember things sometimes a little differently, or sometimes we collectively forget certain things like the, uh, the MTV awards when we did the sort of the, uh, Edwardian Vogue number. We did it twice. We did it again the next night for some charity thing. And none of us, none of us could even recall or remember. We thought the person who told us that was absolutely just kidding us. And none of us could remember. Oh, now that's outrageous. That's such a fan favorite. That's the Marie Antoinette <laughs> type of routine I think you're referring to there. How yes. old were you at the time, uh, Kevin, around all this period? Uh, I was 20. Yeah. That is incredible. What what an experience at such a young age. Do you understand that this period, I'm talking about the tour, the film, the scandal, uh, this period is a defining point in the lives of people all around the world. How aware are you of the impact of this time, this work, and the totally satisfying artistic endeavour, th- the impact on fans like me? Um, at the time, I had no clue. I mean, we obviously were, you know, presented with very rabid, rabid, you know, energetic fans. But the like a lasting impact wasn't didn't really become apparent until uh, the movie Strike a Pose came out uh, with us dancers in it, and we got to sort of travel the world and go to these screenings where thousands and thousands and thousands of people were then telling us kind of these similar stories and, Mm. you know, asking us questions and sharing, you know, the impact that the tour had on us. It didn't, it didn't, uh, dawn on us really, or at least didn't land with us so clearly until that movie came out. I'm going to be talking to you a lot more about Blonde Ambition. I want to know who was doing what, when, how, Kevin, I'm going to be looking for my Oprah moment. I want that. What? What? I want that moment. But before we do, though, you were born in the United States. How did you end up in Singapore? Uh, I had been moving around quite a bit. Thankfully, my parents um, were very supportive of my education. And so I was always trying to get better education, better better education. And I wasn't living them with them at one point and very young, like thir- at 13, I wasn't living with them. And uh, that was for school, not because I didn't want to, but just I was. It was for school. I wanted to go to a better school than I was at, 
And as a sort of a bargaining chip, they were like, well, you can come live with us in Santa Fe. We'll move there. And there's this really great school outside of Santa Fe called the United World College. So I applied thinking, okay, I'll go to this really great school. And the person who interviewed me saw that I was half Chinese and saw that I loved languages and had already lived away from home. And he sent me to the one in Singapore instead. I ended up being one of uh, 10 scholarship students in a school of 2000, uh, where all the other United World Colleges were all like 200 scholarship students and that's it. But this one in the city was like mostly sort of well, independently wealthy kids and then us impoverished 10 scholars. <laughs> In some strange way, living away from your parents, living overseas, doing such an adventure at such a young age probably set you up for that huge experience that was coming in your 20s. Absolutely. I mean, I I completely credit the United World College system for giving me the skills and time management skills and, you know, to to step up to the plate for the tour. Um, If I hadn't been through what I'd been through in Singapore, which was just crazy, crazy scholastic challenges, um, I never would have been able to really man up to the challenge. And um, even in terms of dealing with her, with dealing with Madonna, like I learned a lot of people skills. We were, you know, 160 nations or something represented at our school. Uh, The whole purpose of the school is to create world leaders. So it was really about um, finding common ground with people and realizing that everyone is human. And so being able to come into an environment like the tour uh, and not have this sort of, oh my God, I'm working with an icon. I, you know, she's bigger than life. Not not having to deal with that gave me a space to work with her as, as a peer um, and speak to her in, in real terms with honesty. Professionally, you started out your career with a little known Debbie Gibson. (laughs) At the time, she wasn't little known. <laughs> this is oh, her song. Was, Electric Youth was the kickoff song, wasn't it? Oh, no. Electric Youth was the, the second album, the kickoff oh, of the shame second album. Me. I'm so ashamed. Okay, a well-known <laughs> Debbie Gibson. <laughs> Can I take it back? <laughs> Edit, please. Edit, please. Yeah, it, it, was a, it was a big video for her. It was, I don't know, it was $500,000 or something. And she had done, you know, there's lasers and effects and, you know, dance and a castle and smoke. <laughs> wow. You know, it was much bigger than anything she done before and so doing that electric youth did did it did it create an instant career for you no (laughs) no uh it was a very very long difficult summer that followed uh i did that in february and it wasn't until october that i suddenly started booking everything so look Uh, i want to zone in on that time then that that period of being an unemployed dancer in the united states late late 80s early 90s whatever it was what does that actually look like in reality i mean are we talking hunger and homelessness or what does it look like it looks like absolute desperation um (laughs) when i got the job for electric youth i was living in Santa Monica in a teeny little room that was the size of my desk currently. Uh, And I was working as an au pair. You know, I was taking care of these kids, but I was a kid myself and had no idea how to do anything. So if anything, they were simply supporting me and I was playing around with the kids (laughs) and having fun. I was supposed to be like doing laundry and cooking. I couldn't cook anything. I don't know how to cook anything at all. How did you get the job? My God. Well, the the mom was a prior student of my dad's and it was like out of desperation. I had nowhere to go. And my dad Uh pulled a favor and said, hey, you can stay here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I I even had to, I still had to pay $200 even to have the room, but I was eating it up and out of house and home. So when I got Electric Youth, I mean, that shack was bigger than anything I'd seen in ages. So I thought, I'm on my own. I can do it. I'm going to go off and get my own place. And I did. Uh, thinking that I was just going to work and work and work. Uh, And so I moved from Santa Monica on the beach, no less, on the beach, gorgeous. Yes. I moved to a a weird uh, atrium room in a dilapidated Victorian that was had like eight other people living in the house. And it was a shared, shared bathroom, shared kitchen, everything. Uh, and I had nothing in the room except I think a, a futon mattress without a, without a frame even. Uh, I had a little boom box and I would, I would, uh, I bought the black album by Prince, a bootleg copy. And I would, I would bootleg record it onto a cassette and sell those for $10. And that was how I ate. And, uh, that was it. I, I was very quickly out of money and starving. 
I was I was in dire straits, really dire straits. Um, there was a point at which I didn't eat for three days. And I was Jesus. really, really, really hungry. Um, and I got invited to a movie set for war dancing uh, by a friend, Dominic Lucero. And he, uh, I got to the set and I wore a big overcoat. And while they were filming, I was kind of watching them film, but I was also standing by the craft service and stuffing food in my pockets and eating everything I could possibly eat, like as fast as I could so that nobody would notice. This is um, the definition of living hand to mouth. <laughs> for stuff. real. But I mean, look, those early experiences, I mean, I didn't have anything like that, but uni reminds me a bit of that, going to university, eating noodles and stuff like that. <laughs> so it, we, it helps you appreciate the later stages of life, doesn't it, when you've earned what you've earned? I'm glad I had uh, that experience to try to like, I, I know what hunger is. I know what poverty is and it's, yeah. it doesn't phase me anymore. Like I know I don't, I have no um, illusions, you know, I can, I, I know I can manage if something happened desperate, you know. Kevin, somehow you end up making contact with the Blonde Ambition Project and initially you were not offered a job as a dancer. Yes, I got called in as the associate choreographer, which I didn't even know what that meant when they told me. Um, and my agent didn't even really explain what it was when I told her I got the job. Um, it was quite funny because she was she was so excited and I didn't know what I was in for. All I knew is that I wouldn't be going on tour and that's all I cared about. <laughs> I was like, well, that's not the job I want. <laughs> But then there was some other poor sod who was a dancer and he was fired. I mean, what was it? Did he make the mistake of looking Madonna in the eye? <laughs> he was just, I guess, he didn't really gel with all of us. Like he always felt like he was on the, sort of the outside edges of, of, I don't know, he never socially just felt very strange. He was like a, this odd man out and I was just obsessed with Jose and Lewis and Salim. So I was just, I was just all in their faces all the time. Uh, I think she saw that, that I really got along with them and that I, I, that we, our energy together was kind of electric and inspiring to each other. Um, whereas Kevin's was kind of a, a bit of a dark energy. Uh, he kind of just, he kind of brooded and it, you know, just like when he got fired, he kind of, I, I can't remember, he did something like he st stole something or, or, you know, ruined the hotel room or something weird that he did on the way out. It's like, well, that kind of just shows you right there a little bit. Of that the was energy. the confirmation, right? Yeah. yeah. Understood. Yeah. Understood. I think some of the fans like me, we get caught up in the spectacle and, and the end product because Blonde Ambition was just so incredible, so innovative, so exciting. But let's, let's go through some of the hard yards here. What was the preparation like? Well, it was fast and furious because, um, you know, we did the Vogue video first and this little Nike commercial thing that we that never aired. Um, and so we had, that was like a full week of rehearsals and, and shoot. And then we started into the tour, but before the, the video and everything, we ended up firing the choreographer that had originally hired me, which was Carol Armitage, but she's a modern choreographer from New York who works a little slower than the schedule that we needed to adhere by. So she, so Madonna brought in Vincent Patterson, who she had worked with on the express yourself video. Um, and he thankfully kept me on, uh, as associate choreographer and, uh, we had three weeks to really mount the pieces, uh, create them. And, and, and before we went to the stage, so we had, we would do, uh, we would do one number a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then Saturday we would re review everything. Sunday we had off and then back again on Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, a new number every single day. What do you mean uh, reviewing it? Are you watching it back? Are you filming? No, it? no, no. <laughs> we weren't videotaping it or anything. We were. We would review it by, you know, we would learn it for one day and then just let it go and move on the next day. And then Saturday would come around and we would go back through what we learned all week, those five numbers, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and perhaps add some staging and add various little fixes and changes. How involved is Madonna throughout all of this preparation? And how do you know how involved she is? Um, well, they obviously had their own production meetings and everything about the arc of the you know, storyline and the different acts. Um, and I think most of that came from from Vincent, really. Um, but she, I think one of the, the, the most wonderful things about her is that she she knows when people are good. She knows to, when to trust people and sort of when to put her stamp on things. Um, 
Vin- Vincent had everything really under control. There were a couple times when she was like, I'm you know, not convinced about this step or that. And it's over here. It's this way. I, you said you told me it was this. And I, I, I definitely stand my ground because I, I at that point, my memory and everything was like sharp, and tight as a, you know, tight as a vice. Um, so I, I had no hesitation to tell her, no, nope, it's this, you know. Um, Do you she, remember a specific example like that? A, a particular example? Yeah, I was. I was telling you. You told me this, but I said that. I was teaching her "Open Your Heart." Uh, your heart. This is yeah, the one with Oliver. With Oliver, yeah, I was teaching her moves, uh, and it was something about how the arms went. Um, and she was like, "No, it, you said it was this." And I'm like, "No, I said it was this." And I, I mean, I, I stood my ground on it, you know. And she, I think she appreciated that. She, she, she did it my way, but uh, it, it. There was a little, maybe it was a moment of challenge to me, like just to see if I would hold my ground or like whatever you want to do is great, Madonna. You know, I, you know, I was told to teach her this step. And so I'm teaching her that step. <laughs> do you know, in all the people that I've ever spoken to, I've never heard anyone use the expression referring to Madonna. She did it my way. You should have that on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I, I, suppose, I suppose it is more impressive now, but I could, I could only say those things because I didn't have this, this fandom behind me of like, oh, Madonna, Madonna. Like I had no clue how, how popular she was until we were actually on the road. In working with Madonna, is she ever giving you advice personally or correcting you? What's that relationship like? Um, she never corrected me in terms of dance. Like, she, I mean, it was, she, she trusted me implicitly for all dance things. I mean, I was dance captain, so I had to kind of lock everything in completely and know everyone else's path as well. Um, she definitely gave advice, emotional advice, um, you know, uh, more later on than early on. Um, I think cause she saw that, you know, I had some reservations. I, I held back a lot because I wanted to be professional. I wasn't like sort of out there and being bigger than life because I, I was trying so hard to do my job that I had only just discovered what that job was. Um, and it was new to me. I'd never been on a tour. I was just trying to like manage every, you know, hold everything really tight. Um, but she could see that I was still questioning my sexuality. I was still, uh, also coming from Singapore where it was an English program and and I kind of learned to be a little bit more reserved with my emotions and my expressions and, and to be more subtle. And of course that was not the case with these guys from New York and her herself. Um, so I came across as being emotionally unavailable. And she told me that, that I, my, I, I, I think you're emotionally unavailable. And I listened to that because that's not what I had intended at all. I had intended to be professional it wasn't about being unavailable. I was actually in tears when she said that because I was like, I never had the opportunity to, to talk to you guys on that level because the conversations like that never came up. And I didn't create those conversations. Now I do. Now I'll, I, I talk about stuff all the time. I'll call up, call out stuff all the time. But back then, I didn't have the self awareness to um, to share that side of me. And I wish, I wish she had the opportunity. I wish we had the opportunity, myself and her, to sort of meet each other on with those tools in our pockets now. And certainly presenting myself as who I know I am now, uh, rather than just sort of the guessing game from before. You said those early experiences at school gave you some skills to deal with her. How did you deal with her? <laughs> um, with respect and honesty. Um, I, I, just to stand my ground also, just to stand my ground. Did you feel you needed to stand your ground? That tells me that, you know, this is a formidable presence, obviously. We all know that, but I mean, <laughs> that lived experience. You, you've mentioned a few times I had to stand my ground, which implies there were plenty of opportunities where you had to test yourself on that level. Well, I could see, I, I learned very quickly that people around her could become sycophantic very quickly. And I just was not interested in being that. And I thought that the best way, the best friend I could be was to be real, even if she like insulted somebody else. And I, I didn't just jump in and insult them too. You know what I mean? Like I didn't just sort of jump on board with whatever she, st- she said. I could disagree with, I'm like, that's fucked up. <laughs> you know, I could disagree with, with things uh, in a way that I think some others maybe didn't. Okay, touring the world, we're we're talking trains, buses, airports, hotels, fans, media. Can you give us a sense of what it was like living in that kind of bubble? Um, Well, bubble is the right word because there was no 
you know, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have, you know, I think I had a pager in New York maybe, but like we didn't have email. There was no way, you know, to contact anybody. And by the time the press sort of came out about our show and, and the, the fever sort of hit, you know, post show, we were already on to the next city. So for us, it was literally just this little bubble of us and Madonna and the musicians. And in the U S certainly we were flying private. So we were just us on the plane, us on the bus, us in the hotel, us in the show, us in the hotel, us having dinner. Like it was a full bubble 24 seven. Was it anything like what we saw in the documentary? Well, yeah, it was exactly what you saw in the documentary. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a couple little things that were sort of, uh, can you do that again or come in this way or that was kind of set up to create drama or I know at a certain point she probably she probably started like you know doing things specifically because it would be enticing for the camera and that would be fun and oh let's do something that'll be you know compelling on camera um, but overall you know I thought it was a pretty damn accurate representation of the tour and who we were and what was going on and you know maybe a bit exaggerated a bit bigger than life but um, I think she showed all those sides of who she is. Um, and I particularly like those moments where she's being quiet and she's talking very simply um, because that is, those are the moments and the person that I, I love the most, like the, the big showy, you know, fuck this, fuck that, or, you know, super, you know, diva. super icon diva. Like, yes, it's funny. It's cute for a moment for me. Like it's, it's fun to be around. It's sassy. It's, you know, but I didn't fall in love with that. I, I, the things I appreciated most about her were, were those quieter moments, the moments that, that she stood up for us, the moments that she stood up for others in the world, um, the, the other times that she tried to create peace between us in, as the dancers um, really felt uh, familial. She really did care about us and really did care about keeping the peace between us and, and teaching us. Um, and I really loved seeing her, her, the real depth of her emotion. Like she's a smart ass cookie, not just intellectually, but also emotionally far beyond where I was at at the time. And I, I even, at one point I saw some of her writings on a paper. I just happened to glance over and I, I don't know why I was just there. And I, I was just astonished with the depth of self-awareness and perception, uh, you know, of, of the world around her and her own emotions that level of awareness was something that I had never been in contact with or even tried to come in contact with. And that inspired me to search for myself. The Time to Talk show is a podcast made by passionate amateurs who simply love pop culture. Unlike other podcasts, we can't raise revenue through traditional advertising. So we rely on the support of our listeners to keep us going. If you'd like to make a donation to Time to Talk, click on the link in the description. Your support will help with our production costs and allow us to keep bringing you content that celebrates, honours and skewers the very best and worst in the world of popular music, film, trends and culture. Thank you for enjoying our shows. We absolutely love our growing legion of loyal listeners. You've described it as it was akin to a little uh, family on the go. There were a lot of egos in that group. Yes. Yes, there were. <laughs> How did you cope? Uh, you know, it's funny because Christopher asked me that at one time as well. Because um, at one point, the New York contingency kind of didn't want to be around me and didn't want to hang around me and they stopped talking to me. And uh, and Christopher, I mean, they, they really kind of treated me, you know, with disdain for a while. And Do you have a dancer's? Yeah, well, not not Oliver and Gabriel, I've, I've, and I mean Carlton. We didn't really get along that well back then. Um, Carl, uh, Gabriel and Oliver are always dear friends, uh, but the you know Jose, Lewis, and Salim at the time, uh, there was a mo- there was a, a few moments at which like it got dicey, and so they kind of just stopped hanging out with me and stopped talking to me, and they were treating me a little rough, especially as dance captain. When I had to tell them what to do, they did not want to do what I told them to. Treating you with disdain. What did that look like? So not following your directions when you're the dancer. Not right? yeah, not following orders, not following, not doing else? what I give, said. Give, they, they didn't want to. They didn't want to rehearse. They didn't want to go over steps. They would, you know, you know, fight me on it. It's not that. It's this. And I'm like, well, I'm dance captain, so it's this now. You know, <laughs> um, they 
Yeah, well, dis- by disdain, I don't know if you've ever seen a New York queen read people, but uh, they could they could say some insulting things, and they were not nice sometimes. And Christopher, her brother, saw that and actually came to me to make sure I was okay. He's like, "Are you okay? Because I really, you know, that's really, that's really rough. They're really talking down to you and like treating you like crap." And I was like, "Well, you know, it doesn't it doesn't affect me at all. I mean." That's it. It is their loss if they don't want to be friends with me. It's their loss, not mine. You know, I'm not. But you were trying to be so professional, though, Kevin. So if you were trying to be so professional, and you're very young, and a young person in leadership is always tricky, and they're not (laughs) following your direction, that had to equal frustration to some degree. Oh, it did. It did. It did. But more than frustration, it just made me view them as more immature. Mm. Um, It made me view them as. I guess somewhat self-defeating and less less of t- less of team players than myself and sort of the LA side. I guess you said a few moments ago that you weren't aware that you were even gay at this stage. How, how did the sexual awakening come into this? Because I'm listening to this story about how you're feeling a bit on the outer. They're not respecting you, especially in mm-hmm. the position that you had. They were quite catty towards you. Yeah. Was part of this in the other direction? You trying to make sense of people who were so flamboyant and openly gay? Um, Makes sense of it. Well, I mean, I think they saw me floundering a bit with my sexuality and, and, you know, I don't know. There were, there were just a couple of moments where they were kind of, they were, it all, it really all started because they were giving me shade at one point out at some, we're out at some club. And so I was, I was getting upset. I was getting upset at that point about it. And I drank a little too much and I was, I was not the prettiest drunk person at that moment. Um, I was being a little like stupid and they didn't like that and they felt embarrassed. And then, so then they didn't, they stopped trying, wanting to hang out. I I never, I never, I I never judged them for, for, for their flamboyancy or anything. I was actually obsessed and fascinated with it, but I was observing them in a sense of like, is this what it means to be gay? Do I, is that, you know? Yeah do I, can I, do I have, if I'm gay, do I have to be that? And what became very apparent across the tour was that being gay has nothing to do with who you are. It's just, it's just a a very small piece. And I saw every type of gay LGBTQA around the world, like every kind you could possibly imagine. Then I realized, well, it doesn't, I don't have to deny anything. I can just be who I am. Um, and and gay. right, right, yes, and gay, yeah. And if I and, and then if I'm attracted to a woman later on, I, then I'm attracted to a woman. And you know, if I, it, it really just gave me the sense of like I can do whatever the fuck I want. And so, you're 20 years yeah. old. You're grappling with your sexuality. I, I in the documentary saw a little bit of what happened to Oliver too. That they were they they like to make him uncomfortable and feel awkward. They really did. Yes. Was yes. the same thing happening to you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they they thrived on some level on making others feel uncomfortable, um, and that part of that was to deflect from themselves. And it's a it's a, it's a, an armor that they had learned to to craft uh, to survive in New York. Ultimately, it's because they love you. You know, they're just trying to they're they're testing you on some level, testing me. On, they were testing me on some level, or je- or jealous. You know, sometimes there's some jealousy and some competition. You know, but I think ultimately, in hindsight, a lot of it came from love. When you get a bunch of dancers in their prime, athletic, um, good-looking, fit, and then you're all together in this bubble that you've described, does that lead to a lot of free sex and hippie love behind the scenes? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> not for you, by the sound of I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think Carlton was the one having the most sex of everybody. I mean, and very loudly too, I might add. <laughs> I remember being in, in in Paris at the Maurice and like they have like this open sort of courtyard between all the rooms and they were literally like in the window in the courtyard, like having sex with the windows open and screaming. It was like, oh my God, Carlton, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, oh, you know, man. you know, Louis Jose and, and Slam, they really wore their sexuality on their sleeve. Um, but it was more of a, a deflection because I didn't realize until later that they really are far more uh, uh, not innocent, but they were far conservative. more conservative than certainly I was. I grew up in Hippieville, free love. You know, all my first experiences were all three ways with girls and then girls and guys. Like, so it was, you know, I had a definite, you know, 
more open mind towards sexuality than they did, believe it or not, even though they Isn't seem that to ironic? express it more. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I've got to ask, Kevin, like, did any of them get together amongst themselves? You talk about Carlton. Um, uh, I am assuming you're talking about randoms there along the way. Yeah. Are they all, all along <laughs> with each other? I think at that, by the time we were on the road, I think we were all just too much of a family. Like we really kind of set it into, been yeah, it would have been weird. Like we were all kind of set in this way in, in sort of this familial relationship. Um, it, it would have been a little weird. And like Jose had a boyfriend and Ollie was straight and, you know, Gabriel had a boyfriend and Carlton was just all over the place. And Louis, I think had a boyfriend too. Celine, Celine had a boyfriend too. So yeah, they, everybody, everybody was already like hooked up. Mm. so yeah so i was i was the free one i was the one i I didn't realize it but i was the one running around like trying of course trying to explore my sexuality a little further i'm the one who ended up up along the way like did it help being a groupie on the madonna tour did did it help you pick up i never really intended to i'm not the guy who goes out and like i'm gonna end up with i'm gonna go get some tonight like not at all but i do have to say i did uh end up i found myself with these a, a few really fucking gorgeous, sweet, amazing supermodels uh, along the way. Um, and I remember uh-huh. just thinking, why are they with me? <laughs> why are they, why, how am I waking up in, in the morning with this fine thing next to me? Um, Not at the same time, I hope, Kevin. No, oh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have zero qualms about Would we know that. their names? Would we know their names? Uh, no, no. No. no, but they but they did have they did have huge international campaigns at the time, like huge. Okay, um, yeah. I need to ask Oliver and Madonna. Yes, can you confirm were they a couple? <laughs> I definitely cannot say anything about that. <laughs> um, due you to already have. I mean, due to the lawsuit, I'm really not allowed to comment on anything like that. Unless I say it's my in my opinion, I think that possibly you know that I could phrase things like that a little bit, but. Uh, go on, give it a go. Phrase it. I, I, like that. I that I really wouldn't comment on because that's that's really <laughs> up to Oliver to share. If, you know, if he feels like sharing. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's, <laughs> a, let's let's talk about the show. There were fifty-seven yes. performances. Uh, do any of them stand out to you? Here's here's one that most people I don't talk about that often. Usually, I talk about Houston because it was just ten minutes of screaming and we couldn't hear the music, so we started the show without even being able to hear the music, and we had to oh, you know wow. time our time ourselves by the lights and where the stage was. And when the first beat hit, it was like we couldn't even hear it. Um, that was amazing, um, and the first time I realized how popular she was. But uh, one moment in particular was in Turin, where when we had arrived in Rome she gave this little pest press conference, which you see in truth or dare about, you know, we were called out by the Pope, like literally, I think called the antichrist. And like, <laughs> it was, it was, I mean, it was horrific. And I was, I was fascinated by it. I remember, you know, sitting on the plane with her writing that whole speech and everything, but more than fascinated was when I realized how serious it was, that it wasn't just for fun. And that her statement really did need to be said because when we actually got into Italy and were running around, uh, we were actually getting death threats. And by the time we got to Turin, there was a very credible death threat uh, to us during our concert. And we had to make the choice to get on stage and and do the show even with How that death threat. How specific was that death threat? Uh, it was pretty specific. Like, I mean, we had cops everywhere or whatever, policia, and... I remember, you know, them telling us about it and they had had to ask us, are we okay with it? You know, and, and I had to really sit, I remember thinking to myself, like, if there's anything I'd be willing to die for, it's like, why wouldn't I die for standing up for what we believe in? Or like, this is just, this is a show. And, you know, of course there's the drama, the drama of it all too. What if you get shot on stage? Oh my God, the drama. (laughs) But, um, but it was but like, isn't wow. it fascinating, Kevin, that they, they chose, and I really understand and respect why they did, they chose not to leave that in the documentary. And I suppose, you know, for me, I'm making a big assumption here, but if I was advising Madonna, don't put that in because you, you, you're um, tempting copycats and stuff like that and, and you're making it. Oh, is that you or me? Oh, that's me. Sorry, that's my laundry. Do you know what? <laughs> Sorry, can I tell you? Oh, we've got the same washing machine. Oh, really? Yes. I promise you, and exactly the same distance away as well. 
how cool is that? Because that's exactly what I can often hear in my podcasts, that little song that just came on. Oh, that's high amazing. fives for, for owning – I own the same washing uh, machine as one of Madonna's dancers. High fives. Synergy. Synergy. <laughs> <laughs> but, look, they chose to leave that out. But I, yeah. I love the fact that it dawned on you as you were doing this tour that this is more than pop, and that's why the fans yeah. like me love it. This was politics and religion and pushing yes. boundaries, and it sounds like it became very real to you while you were in, in this particular city. Yes. Well, you know, the first time that it dawned on me was really in Toronto when they told us that they would arrest us. They had gotten mm-hmm. word that we had, you know, that we were vulgar and, you know, public masturbation and all this stuff. And so the police came to us and they were, they said that we will arrest you if we find any content that is not appropriate. And they stationed police at every exit and on the side of stage everywhere. She asked us how we felt about it. And of course, I think it was a shock because it, it really dawned on me, like how like up in arms people get over. It's a show. It's a show. It's a message. You don't have to believe the message or agree with the message. Just fucking watch the show and make your own choice or opinion. It's like, you don't have to prevent others from seeing it in order to like, you know, you don't have to censor everything. Like just to play devil's take advocate, it as art. Kevin, though, to play devil's advocate, this would have been one of the first times that a woman has gone up on stage in front of that many people in such a high profile show and shoved her hand between her legs as vigorously as Madonna did. Yes, but it's not the first time men have been doing it. Men were doing it all the fucking time for ages. Look at and Michael Jackson was doing it since the early eighties. So why is that okay? And it's not for her. Like why was Mm -hmm. women's sexuality so confronting to to the patriarchy? Um, It was it was appalling how in confrontational like it seemed to them. Um, It seemed absurd. I mean, it was it seemed totally natural for us doing it, but then it seemed absurd for the reaction that we got from people. She seemed to find it very delicious when she was told what was going um, on outside the stadium. I yes, I think we all did. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was it was it was so shocking to us at that moment. Then I mean, all of us, me, I certainly me, I was like, "Fucking arrest me, drag me away." You will see. I will gladly go dragged away to the holding tank in my Gautier with Madonna, <laughs> with Madonna and with Madonna and my friends. And then what? Then we'll then we'll be having a fabulous time in our fabulous outfits in a jail cell. It doesn't matter if we're on stage or in a jail cell. We'll still be here and we'll still be fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what could have been, right? What could have been? I mean, I was I was excited for it. I was like, take me away. And so, literally, for that show in particular, we grabbed our crotches every chance we got, licked our lips, like just we're as sexual as we possibly a could be fuck you to the establishment yes right? through the entire through the entire show and then nobody uh-huh. said anything did anything and madonna said at the end she was like they just wanted free tickets <laughs> <laughs> i love it hey yeah. while you were going around on this tour did you have any personal failures on stage mm, oh well i'm not really a failure on my part madonna was in the wrong spot in chicago chicago um, and in Papa Don't Preach. And, you know, we're these angst-ridden priests, you know, r- running away. We can't look at her. You know, she's pleading to us, and yet we we don't want to hear it. We don't want to listen. And she comes to us and sort of is pleading with us. Well, at one point, I'm, you know, assembling away, and I look away, and I don't see – I can't see her. I can't see where she is. I can't even hear her because she's singing the mic. So I don't – she was in the wrong spot and came right up to my shoulder, and I have a blind turn. So I turn – in her direction. So as I turned in her direction, I, li- I turned and my shoulder, cause her, my, her mic was right on my shoulder. It, it smashed her mic and her mic went right into her teeth. Oh no. Oh yeah. Like oh, you heard this whole feedback, every like, loud, I was like, what the hell was that? And I, I realized my shoulder had hit her and I'm like, you know, also laying away the other direction. I look back and she was so furious. I was ready to be fired. I was, I was like ready to take the, take the hit for it. I'm like, I am sorry. I get it. I, you know, I go on. Tell me what happened when you finally got that moment alone with her afterwards. Well, it was before I got that moment alone with her. I I got a moment alone with Christopher who was always under the stage helping her. And and she, he came over to me and he was just laughing and laughing hysterically. He thought it was just hysterical. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And he was like, she's, it broke, it broke her front tooth in half. It did, really. Oh, it, oh, yeah, it did. 
You're joking. Live on live on stage. And I still have not seen a picture of anybody or any maybe she covered it by like not opening her mouth as wide for the rest of the concert, but she was missing that half a tooth for the rest of the show and she got it fixed before the Toronto show. That is unbelievable. Yeah. So I thought I was fired for sure. I ran out to her to the limo as she was leaving and she was like, You're I'm taking this out of your paycheck. <laughs> and I was like, as long as I'm not fired. <laughs> you thought I could do with that? Okay, yep, yeah, I can deal fine. with that part of it. Yeah, but she didn't. She, I mean, it was it was all fine, and she never even brought it up again. She never brought it up again. Wow, incredible! <laughs> this show was really beautifully and strictly choreographed. What was the most satisfying dance routine from that tour? Definitely, Papa Don't Preach was a, a big one for me. Uh, because I felt like we were saying something, but more than that, maybe like a prayer. Uh, it wasn't so dance, dance, dance centric, but it it was cathartic for me. Uh, and I remember feeling exhausted and exhilarated every time at the end of that number because I really approached it as a religious experience. Like you know, feel you know the toe the toe of Jesus. Like feel really feel the spirit fill you. Um, at the end, dancing around like that, like I, I let it all go, like everything go. And in that moment of exhaustion, there's this sort of peace knowing that you've given your all. And there's this, this knowledge that you've shared something truly intimate. I felt like I was really sharing my spirituality in those moments. And that I got a lot out of that. And I think it tied, it, it taught me how to tie my, experience of spirituality to my art do you know that's what came across though in this show this was her big step away from just a normal average pop show although i don't think you could ever describe any of her shows before that as normal or average they were sensational this was theater wasn't it yes absolutely and it was very very consciously divided into acts with yeah. with arcs of energy and to, to give uh the eye a break and to you know clearly clearly compose a message in in acts what routine do you still know like a reflex uh vogue keep it together i can still do where's the party uh i, love that. I can do some of express most of express yourself uh i mean I think a lot of band can do that too, <laughs> a lot of it is just ingrained in my body i think the one i don't really have a, a a connection like memory wise is probably um dick tracy be um, honest with us kevin do you do you when you're in the bathroom do you which one do you do <laughs> <laughs> in front of the the funny, i mean the funny thing is is like you know back then i would take my boombox out on the street and dance in the street all night just to see what my body can do now i'm like if i'm not if i'm not working for dance i'm usually not dancing <laughs> or taking if i'm not taking class or working then I'm not dancing. Like, even if I go out to a club, I want to sit down with my friends and talk and have a drink. You know, I'm not, I'm not out to like show off for anybody I'm or like so try sorry, to prove Kevin, anything. But you, that, you just sound so old. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I sounded old. I'd sit down with a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I, th <laughs> I think I even sounded old back then though. Like I, <laughs> I already felt old back in the day and think she kind of like got a kick out of that. And that's, and I think also the New York kids got a kick out of that, and that's why they were always, you know, pushing me because I, I acted like an older person than I was. Some of those costumes were very tight and a, a little bit revealing. <laughs> a little, <laughs> absolutely sheer. If I didn't have any underwear on, you'd be seeing all, all of it. <laughs> because you've told me that you were like trying to be professional, that you were a little bit more conservative, all of that sort of stuff. Yet some of these costumes, like you say, I mean, there was. You know, I don't think there was anything to the imagination, frankly. Oh, I, I, uh, so I was never. Was you? <laughs> I was never conservative with my body. Uh huh. If that makes sense. Um, I mean, one of my very first dance jobs was in a club. Uh, they handcuffed me, then strung me up, and then stripped my clothes off and body painted me down in my underwear. And it was sort of like this sexual awakening for me. I mean, I <laughs> I went on this boat trip with friends, and I think I, I had the, the, the tiniest, tiniest little shorts. I don't even think they were men's shorts. They were women's shorts, like super, super tiny. With like, I mean, everything would hang out. <laughs> and I would just wander around with like my balls hanging out, like these tiny, itty-bitty mini shorts. Like, I, I really, I didn't have any shame about that at all. But you um, know what, Kevin, the, the thing is, then at least, and 
you're at your physical peak anyway, so you're probably thinking, you, you know, if you've got it, show it, right? Isn't that part true. of it? True. Yes, true. I mean, I, I sort of reveled in things that kind of, I reveled in the idea that I was getting to do sexual enticing things for work, that I was getting to do things that were challenging and like would, 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 you know, make people uncomfortable. And that's my job and I'm getting paid for it. Oh my God. Physically grueling though, I would have thought, because looking at that show, like unbelievable, the, the, um, the athleticism of it all really. I mean, and all of you guys and Madonna and the girls are all so physically incredible like athletes yes it was it was grueling um yeah that it was it was, it was a lot we we wore our bodies down pretty quickly that's why everybody got sick in new york by new york um but it was also because when one of the shows in japan uh it was in the pouring rain which was freezing cold um and Looked so we dangerous. were out yeah oh yeah gabriel twisted his ankle um, mm. but we still did it. We still flipped and did all kinds of things. I, you know, I think instead of my flipping pass, I, I just ran and then slid across the entire stage on the water. <laughs> slid oh, the whole way. It was, it was deep. It was not like just a little bit of water. It was a lot of water. So professionally, this is a peak, right? I mean, the blonde ambition tour for God's sake. Does a gig like that pay well? Uh, it paid decently. It was not as much as like Michael was paying or even share at the time. Um, but, uh, it was decent. I found out later on that I should have been paid twice what I was getting because of me being the associate choreographer. Um, Vincent thought for sure I was getting a completely second salary. Um, but I did not. I got a little stipend on top. Um, so it was decent, but it was wasn't it enough to help you support yourself for a couple of years. <laughs> No, <laughs> I mean wow. it could have it could have been, but I spent it all on tour. Oh, is that true? So, what, oh, you, yeah. because you're you're leading this global lifestyle, so you you're living it big. You know, I have a confession. I'm I'm a clothes obsessive, um, and even from being nine, ten years old, I, even five, five, six years old, clothes obsessive, and but never having a dime to really do anything about it. Certainly not not in the worlds of high fashion. So when you got like, to Paris. Oh my God. Yes. I was, I still have my Gautier that I bought in Paris. I still have all those pieces. <laughs> yeah. And no, I still have them. I keep them here. Like I love clothes and I hate this. I mean, it's, I know it's bizarre, but it's just something about the fantasy. Not at all. Know, not at to, all. You know, that when you put on these clothes, you, you kind of discover different pieces and parts of yourself of who you are. And that's why I'm always trying to find new clothes that are weird and scare me a little so that, cause I can even, I can see myself evolving when I wear things that are making me uncomfortable. Anywho, oh, yeah. anyway, I, I spent most of my money. When I got back, I realized, oh, this job ends. <laughs> and I have just enough money to uh, get an apartment, barely. Um, and uh, that's about it. Let's, let's talk for a little while about uh, Madonna. D describe the Madonna you knew physically. What was she like physically? Extremely strong, but extraordinarily soft. Mm. Like I, I found that fascinating, like, because she did all this resistance training. She was so focused on resistance training because it would give her the definition that she wanted, but yet her skin was just so silky smooth. And like, she was so soft to the touch, but yet so, so, so strong. I mean, by the time we got to the end of the road, like, I mean, her six pack was just like, <laughs> like just like lean, lean, lean. Cause she was, she was just, you know, completely vegetarian or vegan the whole entire time, you know, with her shakes and whatnot and very, you know, you know, smoking and maybe one drink, you know, like that was it always in bed by 11. Like it was a tight schedule. And I really, I learned a lot by watching that. She knows, she knows what it takes to put on a show and keep and maintain that. And, uh, and she has no qualms about regulating herself and her life and her, her um, habits uh, to make that happen. That's amazing. That's amazing. I have to say it's it's one of those traits in Madonna that not every fan is attracted to, but I am. It's the discipline because it's oh been the story of my life. You, If you want to get somewhere, if you want to achieve something, you, you can't just wish for it. You've got to work hard for it. And Madonna is a bloody hard worker, and I, I just love that about her. Tell me, tell me this. What would happen when Madonna walked into a room? Uh, well, I think, I mean, when she walked in with us, we kind of all lit up. It was just, I mean – she was so fun and I don't, she just was so supportive of us. You know, I think she, she got a kick out of 
seeing us interact and kind of got a kick of seeing the world through our eyes because she'd already done it a couple of times and we hadn't. So I know it, it delighted her to be able to give us the world. Um, and, you know, I never, I don't think I ever really got to fully uh, express my gratitude. Um, so I, like, I, I say it often that the one thing I would like to say to her when I do see her again, because I, I know it'll happen at some point, um, is thank you. Like, really, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Like, I, I truly appreciate everything she did for us. It's interesting you say that. If you cross paths with her again, you're longing to say thank you. What do you think she might say to you, given everything that's gone on? She'll probably tell me to fuck off. <laughs> I mean, truly, she hates to look backwards. And certainly, I'm sure I represent some level, not failure, but like, she doesn't like to lose, even an argument or money wise or you know, contract, like she doesn't like to sort of, you know, the appearance that she's lost. With the benefit of some life wisdom now under your belt, and someone who thinks quite deeply, and you've got great insight, I can hear that in this conversation. Who was that Madonna back then? Who was she? Um, she was, uh, someone who still had a lot to lose and was on the precipice of legendary iconic stardom or falling into irrelevance. That's a lot of pressure. Yes, it is. It is. It is. And I, I appreciated the work and effort and work ethic that she put into all of her, everything she did. Absolutely everything. The tour ended, and then, of course, there was Truth or Dare. Were you at the premiere? Yes. Yes, I was. So tell me. And I, I, wore, and I, wore, I wore a completely see-through outfit as well. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah, completely. <laughs> completely. I had it custom-made. It was literally completely see-through, especially with a flash on. I was just wearing a G-string. Yeah. Well, there you go. Madonna had heavily influenced you by that stage, and clearly that was one of the things you'd spent your money on. It's all coming to bear now. I, I'm really understanding. <laughs> Tell me, what what was it like sitting in that cinema and watching that film for the first time? Well, here's the thing. Uh, we had seen it once before uh-huh. um, be- because I forced her hand. Um, you wanted a uh, preview. Yes, because the we were really not given any information at all. Um, the PR just went out without us even knowing anything. And so suddenly we just started seeing articles everywhere about Madonna and her gay dancers. And I'm like, at that time, it was a bold statement to say gay dancers because like, well, you want to work again. And, and if you're, if you're, you know, labeled as gay, then any sort of brand that wants to bring you in is sort of acknowledging that and, and, and approving of that, which at the time was a big deal. This is um, your reputation. Yeah. Yeah. Reputation. Like as a dancer, it always helps to sort of be, on, on some level for me to be a bit anonymous and a bit vague about who you are, what you are like, all, because then you can become anything just like an actor. Was it fairly edited the first time you watched it or was it embellished? What did you make of it? Uh, from the first time I saw it to the next time, uh, the only scene that was missing cause she was fucking pissed off at me for having shown me, having had to show me the film was that she, ed- she took out the scene of me and her kissing. But in our contract, our agent was very clear and specific, and she negotiated for a movie and with a price attached to that movie. So we were just kind of waiting, like, so when is this when is this movie com- money coming? And it never arrived. And so and and so we were like, well, what show show us first of all, show us the movie so we can you know so we can see what we're dealing with, so that then we can sign this release and say yes, this is okay to to to, to show. Also because Alec Kashishan had told Gabriel. Um, in in uh, in Nice, that anything he didn't want to be in the movie wouldn't be in the movie, and so how do you, how can you how can you tell her what you don't want to be in the movie if you haven't seen it? Yeah, so we were we were dared to kiss each other, and so we did, and it was in the original version of the movie, and uh, and then it after our interaction where she was really very quite pissed at us for not signing the release until we got our funds according to our contract, um, then uh, she edited out edited it out there's a scene out there of you kissing madonna that's not in the film because because she was annoyed yes and yeah and it's online you can find it on youtube oh i'm gonna go and look for. i had i had a copy for the longest time and then my all my videos were stolen at one point 
I even had I had I had video of the rehearsals because I brought I bought a video camera and brought it to rehearsal. And so I had backstage stuff, footage, and everything, and it was all stolen at once. And I don't think any I don't think they realized what they were stealing. The part that shocked me in the film, and I don't I don't really know many fans talking about this, is the possible sexual assault of the makeup lady. Oh yeah, that was so confusing. Um, I know. I found it confusing too. Was I, even to this day, after watching it many times, that's what happened, isn't it? There was a possible sexual assault. There was a sexual assault, but I mean, it, I think the Madonna's reaction was so awkward and weird because it just was so left field, and I, I can't remember. She, she, Mama Makeup's talked about it since. It had, I think she was just embarrassed that she had gotten herself into that position where that could happen like that, whatever that situation was. Uh, there were other elements that I, you know, that, you know, bending the truth and that kind of stuff that I wasn't, I'm still not completely clear on. Um, I've heard the real story, but I, I've forgotten what the actual thing was. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was, it was confusing to all of us at the time. Famously, you and others took legal action and you've already referred to that after the release of this. Tell us as simply as you can, why? Um, well, different reasons. Um, but all lumped together. Gabriel started all of it because he was suing because, again, he was told anything he didn't want to be in the movie wouldn't be in the movie. And he asked that that kissing scene with Salim and him be taken out because it would it caused drama, 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 drama between him and his boyfriend. Ah. Um, and it also outed him to his entire family, not all of whom he was out to, and also to the general public. And he didn't want that, and he he was not not comfortable with being that you know, voice of, of gay rights and, you know, gay representation. He wasn't that guy. Um, so he was basically suing for forci- being forcibly outed uh, and for misrepresentation because they had told him that and then ignored him. Um, one of the allegations in the lawsuit, those two sound reasonable. One of the allegations in the lawsuit was invasion of privacy. I mean, you knew there were cameras following you around. So oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but, uh, well... I'm not sure why legally it went into invasion of privacy. Um, I think the invasion of privacy, again, also came to Gabriel because Gabriel, again, he didn't want that shared. And so that becomes an invasion of privacy because they're sharing it without his approval. The other dancers were very, it was me me and Oliver sued only because it was literally in the contract with an amount already pre-negotiated and for a feature film. And they were trying to argue that it it wasn't a feature film, it was a documentary. But feature film refers to the length yeah, yeah, yeah. Feature film refers to the length of a movie, not to, not oh, to the content. That so, is so low. I was wanting to ask you, Kevin. I was trying to. I was going to get you to look at it from the other side and explain it to me from the other side. What was the legal position of Madonna's reps? And you're mm-hmm. telling me that their position was we pre-arranged and pre-negotiated a fee for a feature film. Yet then they tried to argue that it wasn't a feature film. Is that really what you're telling me? Yes, yes. They, they oh, tried to argue. Joking. They they said it's a documentary, so we've already paid you because you did your work. Disgraceful. But in the contract, it says for feature film. And so, it would, well, I don't, after all these years, I come to realize that we were both misled. I think Madonna was misled by her management trying to cover their ass because they, they let that clause slip in. And so they probably all turned it all to us saying, these guys just want money because they're seeing how, how popular the movie is. And they just, they're just greedy and they want money. Um, I'm sure that's how it was phrased to her. And she was hurt by that. And I, I'm horrified that she was hurt by that because I tried so clearly to show that it was just business and that if any if she taught me anything it was to stand up for myself and i had to really think what would she do in the situation she would stand up for herself so if i've learned anything from you this is it to stand up to everyone including you and but, but and, kevin if she, if she realized that she had also been misled then that would figure to me that she'd reach out to you eventually once she realized what was going on and say let's Let's deal with this matter. Well, here's the thing. I don't think I, I don't know that she's ever realized that because I I I realized in the letter that I sent to her, I wasn't talking to her like a business person. I was talking to her like a friend, going, "I don't know why you're not responding." I was doing that, and really, all I had to say was, "It's in my contract." I don't know that she ever even knew that it was in my contract. I don't know that anyone ever told her. But she never communicated with any of you during these legal proceedings. No, not not after no. No. I mean, we, she had a deposition where she came in, but none of that really came up like that. I realized that that given the sort of protection that she sees and, and also the misdirection of everyone around her, like Alec Ashishin and um, the makeup artist, like they all kind of 
they were really hard and harsh towards me and angry at me for mm. hurting her. And it wasn't until I explained the situation that they were like, oh, we didn't know that because all they got was what she got and what the press was presenting, which, which didn't, they, they wanted to sensationalize everything. They didn't want to just say, oh, it's a con- contractual issue. Although I said that on fucking Maury Povich, I was like, it's in my contract. But was there, <laughs> ever, was there evidence that she was hurt personally by you because she was very close, very maternal, it was like a family. Uh, do you have any evidence that she actually was personally hurt by this? Only, only, only by third parties. Only by who third party parties. Who yeah, told who told you me? What? Who told me that she was hurt by, by what we did, and that she felt very betrayed? It's like, well, we felt betrayed. We, you are like our our fucking mother figure, and like we thought we'd be taken care of no matter what. Like you, that you would always take care of us, and then to kind of do these things without our you know, without talking to us or sharing with us or even giving us any guidance or any preparation. Certainly, you know, if she'd come to us and said, will you do this for free? I obviously would have said yes. But by the time that all came up, then it was just a matter of dancers' rights and me standing up for the rights of my entire community that I didn't want my my whole community to continue to be stepped on again and again by by anyone, an artist, a production company, anybody. Um, And I'm glad I did that because I've been a champion for dancers' rights ever since. And I have a strong voice because of that situation I went through. I had to be willing to give up my entire career because of that. Just say, just on, on justice, I'm a double Libra. So justice is everything to me. So I had to be, I was like, I'm willing to like give up everything. I don't know that I'll ever work again. I thought I'd be blacklisted. The case was settled. It took about two years. The figure was never disclosed. Was it fair? I only asked for what was in my contract. So I think it was fair. Was it, I mean, was it fair after everything we went through and risked? Maybe not. I mean, I got some punitive damages that went basically to the lawyer. You know, Gabriel got more than we did because he actually pressed the forced outing. I was forcibly outed as well, but I didn't press it because when I considered what was happening, I was like, I am gay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight over something that's true. Like I'm not going to, you know, I, for me, it felt inauthentic to pursue being forcibly outed when you know, it, it was actually a benefit to me. Like she came out for me. I didn't have to say boo to anybody. I was just out in the world, gay and out and loud and proud, whether I wanted it or not. You know, I can clearly hear from you that there's no regrets. In fact, there's a lot of pride there. Did the case do you damage within the industry? Uh, there were, no. <laughs> uh, there were certainly issues of like, I couldn't work, like not couldn't work. I worked all the time. But there was one point where I I was going to go on tour with Michael, or I was in the running last two people to go on tour with Michael Jackson. And they didn't take me specifically on that tour because of my relationship with Madonna and my visibility being gay and out and great, like that I had all this sort of story behind me. Um, that was you, sorry. I, I, I'm just wrapping my head around what you just told me. Are you saying that there was an opportunity to go on tour with Michael Jackson? Yes. Which you didn't get because of. I suppose when you think of his publicity issues as well, that you didn't get that opportunity because of this scandal. Yes. Yeah. So and when being, I asked you the question, and, tr- and, tr- and truth or da- and truth or dare, because truth or dare was just about it was visible, it was con- controversial. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it wasn't he, and he wasn't interested in more controversy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so exactly yeah. right. So yes, yeah. it did do you damage within the industry. Yes, but that said, uh, I never stopped working, and I worked with Michael three other times, and did and it opened up him. doors to you. I see. Oh yeah. yeah, and he and he very clearly acknowledged. You know, he said he him and Cher both cl- like actually came out, went out of their way to say, "Hey, I'm really glad that you did what you did because you know you you deserve your rights, and thank you for standing up for everybody." Michael Jackson and Cher said yeah. to Kevin. Well done for taking up that issue uh, in the Madonna contract. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. Who keeps you grounded these days? My dog. (laughs) Oh, what's his name? Slinky. She. And I I, I guess, I mean, I really do mean that because when, when everything is done at the end of the day and I'm sitting there with my dog and she's snoring in my face, it reminds me how precious those moments are and how the other stuff is just show. It's it's art, but it's also just show. And I would be very happy if every moment in my life was literally just that moment of face to face with my dog. You know, like it's it's like those moments are precious and uh, I don't take them for granted and I realize that I'm not I don't have to strive to 
you know, to, to be on the biggest stage in the world, I think there's a lot of peace and, and satisfaction that comes from knowing that I don't have to be a superstar. I don't need to have that adoration and fame to find myself and my value and my worth and my joy. I can hear Slinky shaking. Yes. <laughs> she heard her name. <laughs> Hi, baby. Slinky. <laughs> That's awesome. It's it's great to know that you can stop and with Slinky probably and take it all in your accomplishments and the man that you've become too because that's important. Well, I, I'm I'm definitely my 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 own biggest critic. So I'm I'm very rarely completely satisfied with the work that I do or my jobs. Like so, so it's not I don't sit around going oh isn't this amazing look what I did here look what I did there I'm constantly criticizing myself like oh that could have been my leg could have been higher there I could have done that better this could have been faster or look I'm a little too over the top there or I should have been more this like I'm it's never a process of sitting back on my laurels that's why I'm in class all the time tell me this other than dancing what are your passions what what ignites you mm-hmm. uh, fashion I suppose but that's just sort of uh, my own little my little thing that I get a delight out of. Um, I love photography. I get obsessed with photography. Um, I get obsessed with music as well, but see when I get, when I get started into music or photography, I, you'll, I'll disappear for months and never come back. And then suddenly, you know, I, I just want, I, when I'm in it, I want it 24 hours a day. I get absolutely obsessed. Um, that's why I, I, I created that album, uh, called machine and magic under the name that rogue Romeo. That um, rogue Romeo. Yeah, because once I got started with writing music and writing lyrics and you know producing things, I I just got obsessed with the the access to emotion that it allowed me. What's something most people don't already know about Kevin Stay? You no, know, that I know a lot about very old antique lace. <laughs> <laughs> oh, antique lace. Yes. Why? Yes, and that I have a small collection of Pont de Neige uh, in, my, in my storage right now. <laughs> 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 I don't know. It's something about the craft and hand, hand, the handwork and knowing that like those pieces back in the you know, late 1500s, 1600s, they can never be replicated because of the climate created, uh, created um, the fiber that created the threads is it's no longer here. Like we don't have that climate on our planet anymore. So those threads could never be made again. And the time that it takes to make that craft, which caused people to go blind and took years uh, and extraordinary skill, it just will never, ever, ever, ever happen again. And there's just something really magical when you see real lace, like real old, old, old lace. um, It's, it's beyond what you can imagine. You, it, the, it's so fine that you can't see the threads individually. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you, Kevin. I promise. It's just I, I'm getting <laughs> such a good picture of you when you said before that you know you. you I, I prefer to sit down and chat and have a glass of wine. With you. And now you're talking about your old lace, and I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> this old I'm man. getting a good idea about who you are, man. I really am. <laughs> I mean, a lot of that comes from my mom because she's like she collects lace. She's she's collected lace her whole life. I I started buying it for her, like like it, at auctions and things, just for fun. And then yeah. I started getting really obsessed with it because I started seeing what she was seeing in it. And uh, yeah. And that's no, I, 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 I'm a big nerd. You don't know people. People think I'm like I'm a you know a sexy dancer. No, I'm a big fucking nerd. I was like I was the Dungeons and Dragons kid with my backpack You're and big boy. See, yeah, uh, oh yeah, n- nerding out and you know I'm a superhero comic book freak. You know I've read I kept collecting comic books just up until like you know six years ago and I didn't have any more room. Um, Kevin, yeah. I have to ask you about. Um, one of your blonde ambition dance mates, uh, Gabriel, uh, that you've mentioned a few times during our conversation, he passed away. And you yes. learned about that in quite a terrible way. Yes. Uh, yes. I had gone to Italy um, to do a TV show. I had asked him to his face, are, is, are you, do, do you have AIDS? And he said no. And he, did, he said he didn't know what it was that was – causing his, you know, anemia and all this stuff. But his his boyfriend had just died like a year before. But I was so naive that I just took him at face value and I took his word for it. He just didn't want to share or scare me, whatever. I didn't, he didn't want to share that he was dying. And so I didn't, I really was oblivious to it. I couldn't, I didn't possibly, he was so young. How could he be dying? After a show one Sunday in 1995, I just gave him, I gave him a call. Uh, and his mom answered 
And I said, hi, is Gabriel there? And his, his mom, Sue, said, no, and he never will be again. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And then she started explaining, like, he, he passed away two hours ago, and he was coughing up blood, and it was, it was, I mean, it was painful. It wasn't a peaceful, you know, a peaceful goodbye. It was, you know, I could hear her suffering in, you know, in her description, like she was, you know, the brutal truth of it, you know, um, I lost my shit. I mean, I was inconsolable at that point. I, I, it was such a shock to me. I, I didn't all that flood of emotions of like, why didn't I say this or that, or let him know this or that? I mean, I, you know, he was one of my closest friends, but again, I didn't have the, the skill set yet to really express myself. And it was in these sort of life moments between Madonna and, and, and Gabriel and others that um, I really got clear how important it is to share with those that you love, how you, how much you love them. How did knowing Gabrielle affect your life? Um, I, I learned a lot about a peaceful joy from him. Um, like I remember seeing him at the airport and, and he was kissing his boyfriend, Ken goodbye. And, uh, I mean, there were, like yelling people yelling faggot and you know honking and like i mean some really like just horrible looks and stuff and it was like he just didn't care like at that point at that point it was like i'm i'm kissing the man i love and fuck all of you and i'm you know i'm not gonna change my behavior and my life and who i am for you people right around me right now sometimes amateurs know best And the lack of professionalism is all you'll hear on the Time to Talk show. Join Tim and his panel of guests as they wade their way through a range of news, music, and pop culture treats. Time to Talk, the show hosted by amateurs for unprofessional listeners. Strike a pose. This documentary that you made years later it felt to me as a, as a viewer by the way it took me so long to get my hands on it far out because i know it was at some <laughs> festival and it took ages to get to australia and it wasn't on the pirate bay how dare it anyway <laughs> it, it, it felt to me after viewing it it was like closing a loop did it feel Absolutely. the same way to you oh a hundred percent i i don't know that there's any other project or moment out there in my life that has ever given me such a full circle like beginning of chapter, end of chapter moment. Like mm. it really cemented, I guess, a sense of worth and value of my career and, and accomplishments. Um, there was some, on some, some part of me always dismissed compliments to me that were related to Madonna. They always dismissed, I always dismissed them thinking, Oh, well that's about her. It has nothing to do with me, but doing strike a pose and meeting everybody who really very clearly came to us to say, no, it was you, not her. It was your representation that I related to. Like I'm, you know, she gave you the vehicle, but it was you being there, being happy, being open and available and, and present and representing that gave me strength uh, to think outside my tiny little village or to step outside myself or to declare more powerfully who I am. Um, there was definitely a lot of healing. I mean, the last time I had seen Jose, um, well, not the last time, but when we were at that truth or dare table, we had to go around and everybody was telling everybody what they thought of them. And, you know, well, at that, at that table, Jose actually, his, his talk to me was, Kevin, I don't like you. I don't like how you are. If I never see you again in the world, I don't, I don't care. I don't care. I don't, I mean, it was, it was. I was like, wow, okay, got it. And then that was how we left it. So when when the tour ended and the MTV awards were done, like there was no need for me to get his phone number. I mean, he made it very clear. I don't like I don't want to see your ass again. We're we're a hoot together. Like you if you get us together, I mean we're dramatic and crazy and loud. Um, but we also sit back into our old roles. A lot of those same arguments come up, a lot of the same like bitchiness and whatever, all that still comes up. Like we fight, we like we, in those times that we've had since then, we fought like dogs. Like I've had, That's I've true had, family right there. Oh yeah. I've had blowouts. I had a blowout screaming match with Jose on the street. Like the one of the last time that I saw him, it may, it may have been the last time I saw him. Um, what was it about? Um, well, okay. Um, <laughs> When we went on Good Morning America or something like that, we, we, we reviewed the choreography um, 
And then, okay, we, we had no plan. I just saw them for the first time just before the show. So like, what are we doing? They wanted us to do some choreography. So we did the choreography. I went back inside, started talking to the hair and makeup people. I looked back outside and they're learning a whole other routine. And I was like, okay, well, that's weird. And so on the way up to do the show, I said, hey, what was that other combination you're doing? What's the, am I supposed to be learning that? He's like, Kevin, just do the routine. And I was like, okay. I didn't think much else of it, but we got onto this, we got into the show and at the end they had us dance and we danced. And at one point uh, after the chorus, I started freestyling, which is what we were supposed to do or what I was thought we were supposed to do. And they continued on doing other choreography of the Vogue video the behind day? me hmm. because they were trying to make it look like I forgot the choreography. What, to be nasty or because of a yeah, joke? Or? I, I suppose to be nasty. Um, but oh, because stop it. I wanted he, to hear the story where you all lived happily ever after and it's still going on. Right well, up here's the the, I mean, well, it's just, it, it was very, it was rude. And I called them out on it. I called, well, I called Jose out on it or, you know, I, I, I brought it up with Esther, the director at one point, because I was just, I was like, I can't believe that. That's so childish. You know, and didn't yell at me, like, you know, when I'm actually seeing what they're doing and, and yell at me. Well, anyways, then I had run in, I, I, Jose asked to meet me on the way out of New York because I was actually heading to the airport and I thought it was to apologize. Uh, and it wasn't, <laughs> it was to yell at me about like, you know, something about, I wouldn't have needed to have done that if you had, you know, it was it was a very weird conversation, but it oh, ends up being stuff at you about that. Though. Come on. Well, that's the thing. There was it was completely out of time. He was mad at me. He said I wouldn't have done that if you hadn't have done this. Like after the fact. So he would like it, he did that before the thing he was mad at me about, and he said and he was using that as an excuse for why he did the thing before. So this it was like true family conflict. This yeah. So it was completely conflict. out of order, and we're like yelling, and I'm like, "You're like," I, I was so upset because I was like, "This is this is maniacal. This is crazy. Like, it, you sound crazy because you're blaming me for something. You're saying you did this because of something that happened after you did that." <laughs> So yeah, it, got, it just All got the so. Are, do you know the <laughs> listeners are delighted? Absolutely <laughs> delighted because this is like uh, Truth or Dare Part Two. You know? <laughs> well, here's the thing: like, I mean, I, I and I don't back down anymore. Like, I'm so I I will stand up for myself. I'm also standing up for the side of justice and love, but I also don't back down and cower down. Like before, they could like get mad and scream at me, and I'd like shut up because I was overwhelmed and overpowered by them. But it doesn't happen anymore. So I stood. I again stand my ground. I'm always about standing my ground, right? Well, in the end, I was like, I have to get to the airport. I thought you were here to apologize. And I, 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 the last thing I said was like, I love you. And I'm, I'm sorry this is happening like this. And I just, I, I wish you the best. And I love you. And I, I can't remember if I tried to argue. And that's where things are left? Yeah, that's what, that was basically where things were left. And I don't, I mean, you know, we, there's still some weirdness. You know, we, we tried to do a TV show together and then no one was picking it up. And there was, there was a weird moment there. Uh, like between Salim and I. What was the weird moment? <laughs> You're getting the dirt here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, the, the thing is, they were, they were, it was funny because they the, some of the networks passed on us because they said, well, we don't know where the, where the drama is. I'm like, have you seen us together? <laughs> have, you obviously have never been around this sort of electric net of craziness. Someone should that, have filmed that airport Oh, scene. my God. Like, you don't even know what happened. Like, the, the craziness we get into. Anyways, um, Carlton and I had created the show with, with Green Harbor, and um, we were executive producers on it because we created it. And then uh, the other – I guess Jose and, and Salim refused to do the show unless everybody had equal billing as executive producer. I'm like, but we did all the work. We created the show and you haven't yeah. even participated or even returned calls. And then you want to be executive producer on a show that you, we can't even get a call back from you on, but we gave in and, and I, we had the conversation on, on the phone where we said, you know what, it's more important that we just do the show and that we do, we actually do something rather than sitting around arguing about who gets what credit. I don't really don't give a shit, but it is a concession. And I was very clear. I was like, I was like, this isn't just like a nicety. Like we, you, you forced our hand, but like, you know, we had to concede this. Like, it's not very nice. It's just not a nice thing. I, I understand why you want, you know, the what equal the billing. What was this show going to be about? Was it a dance show? Uh, it was it was kind of a it was a, sort of a reality competition uh, based on drag race by any chance? No, not at all, not at all. More based on queer eye. Uh huh. Because uh-huh. because Green Harbor did queer eye. Could it they still also happen? Made, I doubt it. 
No, I doubt it. I, don't, I think we've all sort of moved, moved past it. And also they were the, the kind of the things that kept coming back was that, you know, you're too old. You know, they kept trying to bring in these younger elements of like, you know, here, bring in Adam Lambert and bring in, you know, so-and-so so that you can appeal to the younger generation. It's like, well, you know, if you want us, you want us. Um, I mean, I, we're definitely a compelling crowd, but perhaps not for. I'm you telling know, you what, I want to fly you all to Australia, lock you in a big brother house, <laughs> and just film it. I'd, I'd be a multi millionaire watching it. That would this be just, epic. Yeah, it really would. You have no idea. It the was drama. a lie, Kevin. Striker pose yeah. was a lie. You weren't all happy <laughs> and stuff like that. I wanted the airport scene in that documentary. <laughs> oh, well, here's, wow. the, here's, the, here's the thing is that we. You know, bottom line is that it's all from love. I think the the you know there's this siblings. There's, we're siblings, and it's it shows more and more. Like I I can yell and scream, and and before I would make it mean something horrible, like oh they hate me or whatever. But now I I I know it it's all love. Like I can yell and scream and think that you've done something really fucked up, but I still will love you to the ends of the earth. And Jose and mm-hmm. Salim, every all my brothers. I love you to the end of the ends of the earth. We could have had that argument and somebody could pull out a gun to shoot us and I would have jumped in front of that bullet. For everything you've just said there, if I was to talk to them, be reflective here, what, what would they tell me about Kevin? What do they think of you? Um, I think they think I'm inauthentic. Uh-huh. I think, but I think they just perhaps don't, I don't know that they've evolved to the same level. Not oh, that sounds weird. I don't want to say it like that. Um, I noticed that there's, there's a, I, I feel like I'm a different person than when I met them, but I feel like they kind of, they stayed a little stagnant mm. uh, or at least I, I don't know, that sounds weird too. I don't know. I can't even say that. I, I feel like I'm being, <laughs> disres- I feel like I'm being disrespectful if I say those sort of things, but no, you're um, just being honest, yeah. but I know that they feel like I'm inauthentic. And I think it's because, and I, the, I, the reason why I bring up evolution is because I change, I change because I grow and the things that I may say or believe in the past may, may evolve and grow, uh, to be more well-rounded or, or, you know, evolve. Um, and I, and so I think for them, they see that as being inauthentic to oneself. Like you, like if you're being authentic, then you just stay yourself forever. And it's like, well, I am myself, but myself is also something that's com- always growing. If there's anything, anything consistent in my life, it's that I'm always constantly trying to grow and change and shift and, and not change in an inauthentic way, but grow and, and, and find and discover different aspects of myself. I think even just in the way that I wear clothes, like I never wear the same clothes twice, not because I don't want to, but just because I dress emotionally and I grab what I'm feeling in that moment. And I feel different every day. I feel new every day. And I look for things that will make me feel new and different every day. Um, and for some reason, I think they just see that as, as inauthentic because hmm. that's not their experience, wow. you know? I'm curious to know what you think of Madonna these days. She's in this relatively uncharted territory. No, she's a pop act. She's mm-hmm. still active. She's still working. She's in her 60s. What do you think of her most current work? Um, well, I loved Madame X, the, the show. Um, I thought it could have been even developed even further, but I, was, I loved her accessibility to the audience, um, that she doesn't, have anything, she doesn't have anything to prove anymore. You know, like she's kind of – she's she's secure in her you know in her legend status in her legendary status i think um i'm so overjoyed to see her with her family i because i know how much it meant to her like this i was with her at a time when family like that was a fantasy and then to see it actually come to fruition it's just so beautiful it's beautiful to see her like is she that. still as engaging as ever on stage? Uh, I don't think so. Not at the same level that she was before. Uh, but again, she was injured and had, you know, hip and knee injuries and all these things. So for, for, you know, I get it. <laughs> yeah. I would have everybody dancing around me and stand and be standing still too. I mean, she went and that's not exactly what she was doing, but I'm saying she, she really gave a show for the amount of injuries that she has and had. So um, if, if you had the chance to work with her again, uh, dare I say this, what advice would you have for her? I, I would lean, I, if I were, here's, if, not advice, if I were directing her. Yes, if you in, were choreographing in a, her. In a yeah. direction. If I, I don't know about choreographing, because I feel like you know, those kind of days are a little, little behind. But um, I would say in terms of direction, 
I would lean more and more into that sharing of herself that she uh, had in Madame X. Very, very briefly, uh, Kevin, Michael Jackson, you've, you've helped choreograph black or white. Well, first of all, he's the most sort of appreciative person ever. Like, you know, like the, the, the moment I walked up was like, he had this like sparkle in his eyes and was just like, looked at me up and down and all, everything he had to say immediately was like, oh my God, how did you get your teeth so white? Oh my, I love your knee pads. You know, that's why he actually, <laughs> that's actually why I started wearing knee pads was because I was wearing the knee pads from tour from, from, um, from keep it together. Wow. Um, yeah. There and then from, so literally, from, that. literally from that moment on, then he was just always wearing those knee pads all the time for years. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was just this moment of like, he was acknowledging like my skin, my teeth, my knee pads, my, how I was dressed. Like he, you know, analyzed every single thing about me, like meeting me fresh. Like it was, you know, when you when you appreciate something, there's a, there's like a delight and a lightness in it. That's, that's how I felt when I was brought in to meet him. I felt appreciated and, uh, and it was, and very, he was very open had Michael changed by the time you helped him with blood on the dance floor? Yes. Yes. He had How gone so? through a, He had gone through a lot with the drama, with the, you know, lawsuits and, you know, just the press and time had changed. You know, he'd just been through so much and dragged through so much. And I don't know what of it is real or not, or, you know, I, I, I love Wade also. So it's hard for me to reconcile you know, Wade's what Australian. Wade, yeah, what Wade is saying versus, you know, how, what I saw of him. But everybody has multiple sides. So I, I, I don't know that I can exclude it, especially since, you know, I really do trust Wade, honestly. Like, it's – maybe there were some weird timing things with Wade's words and when he did things. But I don't know. There's something about me after – especially knowing Wade since he was nine. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, he didn't really have much to gain from it, honestly. We need to make it clear too. Wade Wade is one of the uh, the uh, dancers. Uh, he worked with Britney Spears, but he is one of the people in uh, Leaving Neverland who made accusations against Michael Jackson. And um, and I you're don't... saying that he's a friend, and you've got no reason to doubt him. I don't have any reason to doubt him, but I also, I mean, I have to believe that he believes in what he's saying and what he, and what happened. But it's also extremely hard for me to believe that Michael would ever, ever, ever hurt or knowingly injure a child because, knowing how much he loved them. The only, the only way I could think of possibly reconciling those two things is that, that Michael's sexual growth on that level was perhaps stunted to the point where he saw himself as a child. And so was relating to these children as peers. But Wade's description is vivid and detailed. I know. And I actually have not heard all of it. So yeah, I, I've tried to guess sort of stay out of it a bit and just sort of celebrate what was, um, but also champion the ability of uh, survivors to tell their story and to be heard and also believed. Beautifully said, Kevin, which pop stars get you excited these days? <laughs> um, and it doesn't matter what answer you give me. I'm going to edit it so that it says Kylie Minogue. <laughs> 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 oh my goodness um uh, oh gosh uh right now um hey listeners um kevin hasn't taken the hint <laughs> <laughs> he I just mean... glossed right over that didn't he <laughs> Well, she's never have hired to go and me. To this she's guy. never hired me, so <laughs> <laughs> she should be um, so lucky. She did actually use uh, a piece of mine, I guess. Though um, um, Tony Testa used to choreograph for my music and my performances, and got his job with Kylie Minogue doing that fucking amazing tour that he did for her. Uh, got the job uh, showing the pieces he did for me. Wow! So there's a connection. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Kevin. What keeps you up at night? <sighs> loved ones, um, loved ones suffering. My ex uh, f- fiance killed himself a few years ago, um, and then it turned. And I had, uh, I, 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 I think a lot about that. Like, did I do enough, or is there anything else I could have said? And 
And then I also just found out recently that the guy I dated after Michael, before my my, my last boyfriend, Gordon, uh, also killed himself um, just recently. So it's, it's been a little heavy. Um, and then I also found out that same day that another friend of mine died three years ago, not knowing because he moved away to Chicago. Um, and I a went lot to his of loss. Just, yeah, it's just uh, that that keeps me up. Um, am I, am I expressing my love enough to those I love? Am I vocal enough? Cause you know, not, you know, this, this last one who killed himself just recently, he reached out to me, you know, a couple weeks before, uh, and he sounded really crazy and I kind of dismissed it. I was just like, I didn't really want to engage. So I was like, until you're a little more sane, I don't know that I really want to engage in that. And then he was gone. Final question. What's the definition of beauty? I think beauty is simply appreciation. Um, it's not about a physical attribute. It's really just about the act of observation, the act of appreciation on any given thing, topic, subject, self, person. You know what? Even though that's a beautiful response, I'm, I'm disappointed because... <laughs> I thought you were going to say Madonna and Dick Tracy. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That has to be one of my very fa- very least favorite looks of all time. Um, <laughs> not, not a fan of that look at all, at all. Um, <laughs> we started with revelations and we're ending with revelations. This is a wonderful thing. I tell you what, Kevin, it's been so unbelievably wonderful to talk to you. I mean that absolutely sincerely. It's been a great conversation. I'm taking a lot from it. Congratulations on taking life by the horns, taking those experiences you've had and, you know, they can call you inauthentic. You're not. You're just somebody who's (laughs) really digging for that deep, rich personal growth. And The funny thing is, is I actually, when I, I hear those things and I don't just dismiss them, I actually apply them and say, is that true? I also want to say, that you almost said the exact same words that Madonna wrote on my birthday present when I turned Get out. Yeah, when I turned twenty. Oh, tell me. Uh, she gave me a copy of the um, the Immaculate Collection, and she wrote on it. She wrote uh, to my I don't know, like to my dear Asian little Asian beauty, grab life by the balls and don't let go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Maybe someone else's balls, though, not your own. (laughs) Well, I listened and I did. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Kevin, thank you so much. Thank you for all your time. You've been very generous. Thank you so much. The pleasure.